Hello, I am Phineas 12 Gage, the man, the myth, the heretical malcontent. Today is a wrap up of last week's episode about the rise of the religious right in America. This week is focusing on the philosophical and theoretical underpinnings of the evangelical right, and I have to tell you, it doesn't hold up very well, and it's really pretty gross. There are multiple political philosophies that Christians like to pretend are compatible with Christianity. One of the positions that they like to try and hold are that they're not dominionists, but since dominionism seeks to institute Christian law in whatever country happens to be on a planet with Christians in it, they are 100% dominionists, but also libertarians. So, a small government, but one where we'll kill you for sucking a dick if you happen to have one, or having an abortion instead of dying in childbirth, and your dad will kill you with rocks if you fuck before marriage, and if you're for sale if you're raped. As theocracy. So dominionism as a uh, idea is terrifying, and libertarianism isn't so great either. And they mix like oil and water and shit. The most coherent account I can find of this septic milkshake is from Stephen Palmquist. Now, I say most coherent, but realistically it's a low bar, so bear with me. A lot of this came out of Stephen Palmquist's book, uh, Biblical Theocracy, and that is a book that is ostensibly a philosophy book and trying to find the best sort of government for a Christian worldview. It is a deeply terrible book, and the fact any school gave this doofus a philosophy degree has me rethinking the goal of my education, or kind of education in general. Chapter 1 is about how Aristotle is big into politics, especially how he viewed politics as a partnership between people, and with that idea of politics being a partnership between people, I'm I'm actually okay with it. This isn't where Palmquist lost me. That comes not so terribly far later. To make his point, Palmquist starts off by trying to talk about how Aristotle wasn't big on democracy. The problem here is that he's trying to equate two things that aren't as related as we like to pretend. He's trying to take the Athenian direct democracy with symposiums and shit and equate it directly to our modern democracy, which is a representative democracy and is more like what you would see in Rome as a republic. So it kind of falls apart. But he is right that Aristotle uh, felt that aristocracies or kingships with virtuous kings or generally the most virtuous and wise people in charge in a small number was better. And that's how we spend chapter one. It's just a, a Introduction to Aristotle's idea of politics. Now, how that's relevant is after Aristotle, a long time after Aristotle, uh, there was this guy named uh, Averroes, otherwise known as Ibn Rashid, was basically the guy who preserved Aristotle, and that's a really big deal. And it's important to, to recognize, though, that that means that we got Averroes's version of Aristotle, because when it started to enter Christendom. Aquinas was working off of Averroes's commentaries on Aristotle, which is how Aristotle ended up in Christian philosophy and in Christian history, and why he's relevant to this conversation in the first place. And using these definitions, which if you paid attention and know what words mean, you know that what definitions... He sets up democracy, which is presumably direct, because much like in chapter one, he's not clear, as the most Christian form of government, with two assertions that are evidently silly bullshit. My words. The first is that God is the only one good enough to rule, and the second is that democracy would grant freedom of religion, what with all that pluralism. But after setting those up, he has to knock them down. So he does so by asserting that the first point is wrong because no system of government is good because of sin. And freedom of religion is bad because the Bible says that religious freedom is something you have in spite of your government, not because of it. This is where the book started freaking me out, because that is very, no, freedom of religion is bad because then you're not forced at gunpoint to be a, my kind of Christian. See, the thing is, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are bad goals, and the fact that democracy encourages them means that it encourages people to walk away from the one true place. The fact that people want to live in a pluralistic society, a society where they are encouraged to make their own happiness in their own life, 
because they have the liberty to do so? No, no, no. No. That is unholy. And that is wrong. You see, liberty says that you get to, you get to choose your own way. But only Jesus is the way. And life, only Jesus gives you eternal life and the pursuit of happiness. What these silly secularists don't know is that that is the pursuit of Jesus. It is the duty of Christians everywhere to give up their rights. As it says in Ephesians 6.6 6 and Romans 6.22, it, it, it says that you are supposed to be slaves of Christ. So how can you defend a political system which encourages people to defend their rights rather than be a good Christian? Uh, the defense of that system is actually pretty easy. Go fuck yourself, Palmquist. You're on really terrible epistemological ground. There's no reason to believe in your God, and I hope you get eaten by butthole beetles. But assuming that God does exist, and assuming that Jesus is the Christ, that relationship with God is like a parent. So he says, quote, From the child's point of view, the parent's authority is absolute and cause for loyal obedience, even if the child does not understand the reason why. End quote. Now, this didn't land with me, uh, because I'm an evil, secularist, atheist, liberal parent who encourages their child to ask questions about the rules, because there is value in understanding why a rule is in place, and honestly, I've been questioned about rules and why we have them in the house, and just done away with them, because when questioned about it, I realized there was no reason for that rule to be in place, and I was acting like an authoritarian, and it's made me a better parent. So, I don't know, maybe God should have a suggestion box and be a better God. But it's these things that Palmquist has said that uh, leads him to understanding what freedom of religion truly means. It means being a slave who recognizes their total poverty in regards to rights like a free person, because you see those God-given rights in America? They're not real. And that's how democracy is actually the opposite of religious freedom. It says that people can have rights, and right there, it's Satan. Because rights are the work of Satan, all of them, every single one. The right to vote, Satan. Life, liber life liberty, pursuit of happiness, Satan. Black people not being slaves, Satan. Because Satan is is always the good guy, for whatever reason. And all of these things, Satan ends up look. This, Satan ends up being the guy who just looks the best. God is an enslaving monster. Satan wants you to, you know, have human rights and clean water and the right to fuck who you want and do a dance. And Palmquist goes on to expound on all this by saying that we're supposed to rule over the earth and not other people. And this is where it starts to get super libertarian, -y, which you think would fit in perfectly with the fact that Satan wants you to have rights to not be infringed upon by violence or coercion. But no, no, that's not it. This is also where it really starts to make sense as to how this solidifies the evangelical rights views. Because he answers a question that has been on my mind in this podcast, and has been on my mind as to how you get rid of government and the state, and keep it in line with dominionism. And the answer to that is, Cain killed a guy. It's been covered on the Bible study episodes, but it seems like a pretty non-controversial stance that Cain killed a guy. The controversial part comes in with the really, really kind of weird logic that you have to get to by shoving Aristotle into the Bible, because Aristotle spoke for God and hated cities. And that is, uh, and I, I don't think Aristotle hated cities, but the that's what Palmquist says, and the way he substantiates it is by saying that Cain went and married some fucking buddy and founded a city or found a city. The The Bible isn't clear, but the the opinion of Palmquist is that Cain invented cities. And this, to Palmquist, means that the cities are evil by transitive property of evil. So by politicking, you're following in the steps of Cain and rebelling against God by killing your brother or something. It's a good argument for Satanists and atheists living in cities and being involved in local politics. He also uses Judas to back up this wackadoodle nonsense. He says in Luke 22, 3, Judas is used as an instrument of Satan because Judas wanted Jesus to set up a worldly kingdom. This, in case you're keeping track, is not mentioned in the Bible. What is actually mentioned in the Bible 
and the way that the apostles act is like Jesus is setting up a kingdom on earth when he gets back. During their lifetimes, Jesus promises. So it's hard for me to figure out what Palmquist was talking about, but it does get me to question his biblical literacy since there are no citations. That said, when you study philosophy of religion, the God you end up talking about is usually quite a bit different from the fundamentalist, biblical, literalist God, which doesn't actually need to be framed or based at all in the Bible to be considered legitimate. Anyway, Judas wanted a payday, and apparently when we were all holy enough, uh, unlike Judas, all the governments will fall and we'll get the politics of love. This is where everyone is so free we all kneel down and are enslaved to God. Sorry? Sorry, absolutely committed, is how he puts it. And then we'll all get along, because in Revelations, it says that Jesus will reign forever. Or they could just quit calling bigotry Christian persecution and being a bunch of fucking pricks. And from there on, it kind of sounds like he's talking about democracy, or maybe a Lao Tzu-style government, where the leader is such a good leader no one knows he's there? Uh, quite frankly, there's very little I wouldn't do to get one of those right about now. Anyway, so if that's the case, maybe it's not so bad. And then we continue our dark turn from the we're all enslaved so we can be free stuff. He says the main problem with theocracy, and this is a quote, and the reason I believe it is so difficult to implement without perverting its intended form is that it requires people to have enough faith in God to make themselves vulnerable to abuse, both from their fellow countrymen and from outside invaders. Theocracy requires individuals to take absolute risk with their lives, just as Jesus did at Gethsemane, by resisting the temptation to appeal to man-made laws or human saviors or self-protection against unfair treatment. It flies in the face of ordinary worldly rationality by claiming the way to have true life is to die. The rationale for living in this way was never entirely clear to God's people, except to specially gifted individuals such as Abraham and Gideon until Jesus came to show everyone can live by the way of the cross, which with he substantiates Matthew 16, 24, 25, which says if, if you want to follow Jesus, you have to pick up your own cross and follow him because then you'll die. Which is good? And these people wonder why we call him a death cult. So as confusing as that is with the kind of government he does or doesn't or maybe does or possibly hates or kind of does maybe want, it gets a little more confusing as you go on because this was written by somebody who was on ecstasy riding a roller coaster, I guess. It's just a not great points. Like I said, it falls apart just from looking at itself. So, uh, he believes that theocracy is hard to implement, but in the beginning of this, he argues against theocracy in favor of theonomy as a tool to destroy democracy. Uh, this may not shock you, but there's not a lot of fucking civics in the Bible. But there is the Book of Judges, and he thinks it's a holy and divine guide to government, but it was a theocratic state, and that was a fucking Dark Ages, and one of the roughest books in the Bible. So I'm not sure what part of that he likes. And he really doesn't say, except it's a theocracy. So that leads him back to why theocracies are hard to set up. Now, he says it's because people are too vulnerable. I think it's because throughout history, we have had theocratic Christian states, and we have had theocratic Muslim states, and Buddhist states, and all the religions at some point have been top dog in their region. And we have had crusades, and we have had inquisitions, and we have had genocides, and we have had the spreading of dangerous misinformation that gets people killed. We have had persecution, and we currently have a fucking global child sex cabal that uses their sovereignty and holy swagger as a way to maneuver away from culpability for what they've done. So yeah, maybe theocracy should be hard to fucking set up. And never mind the fact that now he's arguing for theocracy and he spent the first chunk of the book arguing against any kind of government aside from a theonomistic libertarianism. And frankly, those are both bad things. But he is right. Like, I, I will give him credit for that. There is one thing that he's right on. And it's that it does fly in the face of rationality to live to die. And it doesn't make sense that he would say that it was clear to Abraham. The Bible has covered Abraham's story. Now, we've covered it in the Bible study. And it hasn't said anything about dying. Just a lot of fucking. So, that seems extra biblical nonsense. Which is nonsense squared. So, then Jesus showed up and showed everyone how to die. And that's why we need these horrible things. 
It doesn't make any sense, even if you consider the fact that Jesus wasn't anything special, from the magic tricks and miracles to how he did them, to being crucified for being a political menace. Even if you consider him as just a political leader, there is not a single political science idea from then that would be applicable to now, like Palmquist once. But instead, all of these bad ideas are cloaked in the idea that people are worried about people being too nice. He seems to think that the real reason for this whole enterprise is so hard is because people aren't willing to open up to everyone who will be nice to them, never mind the fact that every day people are exploited. I mean, I'll tell you what, Pumquist, you think people are worried about people being too nice? Tell that to the 137 women who are killed every day by a partner or member of their family. Tell that to the teacher who was just recently killed in Paris for teaching about Charlie Hebdo. Tell that up to Charlie Hebdo. Oh, you can't. Tell that to everyone throughout history who has been hurt and tortured and killed for either theocracy or libertarianism, and then tell me it's because people are afraid to be vulnerable. Tell me how people being on their guard because they're afraid of very real threats of violence are afraid to be vulnerable. Tell that to thousands of assaulted children, most of whom are now adults and some of whom have died of old age. Tell that to the Rohingya people who were killed by Buddhists in Myanmar. Tell that to victims of crimes who have had their assaulters get off easy because they're pastors in the U.S. Tell me that the problem is that people aren't vulnerable enough, and it's not misogyny and religion being too powerful of a force in people's lives that lead to things like the murder of Planned Parenthood doctors by Christian extremists. But he sees that we might have questions at this point, and being a philosophically minded gentleman, like a good philosophically minded gentleman considering the other side of the positions he will not predict any of what I just said or anything that could be against his point that he hasn't already mentioned. Instead, we're told that heaven appears in the hearts of each individual. Also, it's a place, I guess. And we're asked what type of political system, i.e. legal coercion, best promotes social justice. The answer is go fuck yourself, it was a trick. The answer is libertarianism, because people don't take politicians seriously as public servants which will make it hard for a theocrat to be taken seriously as a public servant. And I have some issues with this. The first is that liberals tend to take politicians being public servants very seriously, but Palmquist doesn't like liberals, so we can go fuck ourselves. Incidentally, I would also love for the government to stay out of people's lives. Conservatives like to talk about how they want small government that stays out of people's lives, then go on to legislate who can stick what, where, and what kind of health care you can get, and what kind of marriage you can have, and all other things that are moral decisions, and not the government's fucking business. Liberals want you to have health care, and an education, and the tools and health for you to reach your full potential as a person. For society to run smoothly, and for us to not devolve into unregulated cesspool, full of asbestos pipes, lead paint, poison food, because guess what? If people weren't doing that shit, we wouldn't have regulated it, and there's no reason to think people won't again if we unregulate it. So yeah, liberals want regulations and want Amazon to pay more in taxes than you did to watch a long gone God's Not Dead or some shit with god-awful movies. That should be fine with you, because that's how the government stays out of your lives. Marry who you want, have an abortion if you need it, for whatever reason you need it, have access to all kinds of contraception and a good education about what they are and how they work, because nobody fucking uses abortion as birth control. That was made up. People tend to get more abortions when they don't know what the fuck birth control is. Fuck who you want, do your drugs, leave people alone, and I, I know that, you know, we're never going to get all drugs legalized, and that's fine because there's some drugs where you're just not going to fucking leave people alone, but I don't see a reason to get all weird if you're not hurting anybody. And that sounds a lot like libertarianism, honestly. But with, like, the government to do, like, roads and hospitals and pay for shit and stuff and reform the police so they're not a paramilitary hit squad, do all of that stuff so we can just fucking live. But no, that's not good enough for Stephen Palmquist and the Falwells and Trump and fucking Reagan. No, they, they need to scream about a small government and instead control every aspect of your life to make sure that you are Jesus-y enough for the Jesus Club. And the flip side to that, libertarianism, is that there are no worker protections. There are no public works like roads. If you can't afford your fire department bill, they let it burn. 
If you demand to be paid in something other than commissary tickets, they fucking murder you in the Ludlow Massacre. As a liberal atheist, I find the idea of politicians not being public servants fucking repulsive, and Palmquist to be an idiot. Now, this book has two more chapters, but they're just about love and not hating and other things we would have already if people like Palmquist would just shut the fuck up and fuck the fuck off and quit adhering to I'm the only one to the cure with the disease I am mentality. Now, let's consider what they're saying officially, right? Because we're moving on from Palmquist. Um, and while keeping in mind this is the, the model of society libertarian Christians would also like to see. I'm going to start by uh, going through the Bible verses that it's been expressed that they would like to have become law. If a woman is found not to be a virgin on her wedding night, she shall be brought to the door of her father's house, and there the man, men of her town shall stone her to death. Uh, Deuteronomy 22, 20, 21. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress must be put to death. Leviticus 20.10, which... Sorry, Jerry Falwell Jr., Donald Trump, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. Leviticus 29. For six days work is to be done, but the seventh day shall be your holy day, a day of Sabbath rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it is to be put to death. Exodus 35, 2. And for people who say that all the misogyny and bullshit wouldn't exist if we just followed the New Testament, which doesn't contain law, it's a... It's largely a Dear Abby column for psychopaths. 1 Timothy 2.10-13 says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But suffer, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And for people who say that Jesus got rid of the old law because he said you can eat shellfish, Matthew 5.17, Don't think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. These verses form a lot of the basis of uh, what's commonly called Christian Sharia. These are laws that are manifesting in a Supreme Court just over the horizon taking away people's birth control as part of taking away abortion because of their religious views. Taking Title IX away. What was she wearing becoming the law of the land at first? We are already seeing the starting of this in an anti-LGBT Mississippi law that went into effect in 2017 called colloquially the Turn Away the Gays Bill. Section 2 states that, quote, marriage is or should be recognized as the union of one man and one woman, end quote, and then, quote, sexual relations are properly reserved for such a marriage, end quote, and that should terrify you, because that means that they felt fine doing that. And these are the people being enabled. And in case that does seem like a bit much, because I get it, let's talk about the states that only decriminalized being gay in 2003 with Lawrence v. Texas, which was a law regarding sodomy. Alabama, Florida, Idaho in 1971 until 1972 when they decided to bring state-sanctioned homophobia back until 2003. Kansas, Louisiana, Michigan in 1980 and again in 2003. Although heterosexuals could sodomize each other since 1988. Puerto Rico, except for heterosexual oral sex, which was decriminalized in 1974. South Carolina, Texas, Utah, and Virginia. Whew. Good thing we have a super liberal Supreme Court with no fucking interest in rolling back all progress to the Bronze Age and nobody representing districts and federal and state governments calling for the executions of LGBT community and a religious fundamentalist in the second highest office in the fucking country with absolutely no encouragement of it from people who think that gayness causes hurricanes and tornadoes. Wait. That's a magical fantasy land where we're all grown-ups who don't need people from 200 years ago to set up a system where we can't just, like, up and honor kill. Fuck me. In the last part of this, wrapping up this, this two-episode series, I'm going to talk about some stuff that talks against that, and I'm going to fill in a little bit of history where I may have missed it before. In 2007, uh, Chris Hedges wrote the book American Fascists. He is a graduate of Harvard Divinity School and worked as a foreign correspondent for the New York Times, and he's a Pulitzer Prize winner. So when it comes to reporting things, he seems pretty legit. Now, I haven't read his book, but I, I watched an interview on it, and there's some things there that seem prescient as fuck. He called that the Dominionists were hijacking evangelical Christianity. And, as was discussed in the last episode, they were 30 years in at the time he was giving this interview. 
This is going to be a mostly a, a series of his quotes and points that he makes because I can't make them better than he did. Quote, the purpose of creationism is not to offer an alternative to evolution. The purpose of creationism is to destroy the possibility of dispassionate, honest, intellectual, and scientific inquiry. It is to make facts interchangeable with opinion. It is to make lies true. This is a fundamental aspect of a fascist state. Because if you have an enemy, say Muslims and the Latinx demographics as a whole, uh, and you can make people feel that your opinions about them are as valid as the facts about them, you can then use your ha that hatred of them to Hitler about the Jews about it and institute human rights violations on the southern border of the United States while everybody is too busy screaming about the billions of people who are terrorist Muslim. Oh, wait, sorry, the small segment of people who are terrorist Muslims to actually pay much attention to the fact that that's what's going on. Because everybody who's not distracted by that is distracted by whatever dumbass bullshit shittery you decide to pull today. You can convince people that you are a divinely chosen king who can do whatever he wants, which has been the game since Reagan. And Bush also, according to Hedges, was a, a he was a key link between corporatism and evangelicals, which I, I think is something we can all agree on. And I think we can also agree with Hedges that he wasn't smart enough to be a fascist leader. And I, I don't think Trump is either, but much like Bush, I, I think that Trump has people around him who are, or if not smart enough, clever enough and insidious enough. So the thing is, religion exists, and, and we're here because religion exists, and religion exists because people need metaphysics to fill the gaps in their actual physics. They need a god of the gaps. Gaps in your knowledge is scary, and it makes sense that you want them filled with something other than I don't know, because it takes work to get to that point. Fortunately, God is always the right size to fill that hole. So you take, according to Hedges, these people that can't cope in the real world, and so they retreat to a fairy world full of them being persecuted, fighting a war against secularism, and then you give them a prolonged period of instability. Like, you know, post 9-11 fomenting anti-Muslim bigotry, and then during the Obama administration, literally everything the Republicans did, while making shit up to manipulate people into fascism. I mean, I, I want this to be me being a conspiracy monger, but we, we've all been watching them do it for the last 20 years. Now, when considering these ideas, it, it is important to keep in mind the concept of moral luck, which is something that Hedges brings up, not in those words, but he brings it up. Because it's really easy to villainize these people and pretend that they're evil people driven by evil impulses to choose evil things. And that's not the entire truth of it. So, moral luck is Thomas Nagel's idea that our actions are made up of two things. Our constitutive luck, which is our thoughts and our feelings, our the internal phenomena, and our, our circumstantial luck, which is the external phenomena, what's going on around us. Buddha put it as a mindfulness of your thoughts, feelings, and emotions, and all other conditioned phenomena. That's how I understand it, right? And Nagel says that we're driven in our actions by those factors, and that's moral luck. And I have a little bit different of a view about it. I, I am a compatibilist. Uh, my view is that we have a certain number of choices, which we have to accept zero as a number, and we choose among those choices. The choices we have at a given moment, greater than or equal to zero, are the options we have, and the only options we have. So that is to say, they don't necessarily have a choice to be stupid, and that's part of their constitutive luck. Do we sit back and let our society and safety collapse into despotism, or do we stamp out religious despotism, get our secular government back, and work on stamping out the religious despotism in the rest of the world? Or do we continue like we are, pretending that America isn't somehow at risk of these things, and that we all have to vote, and we can just carry on being pissed off at Khomeini and treating Matt Gates and Matt, Mike Lee and Matt Shea like they aren't dangerous right-wing radicals helping the evangelical right drag us to the same place they choose to be. Now, I make the moral luck point to say this. We don't just need to vote against theocracy, because theocracy is on the ballot. Seeing how much of a unique danger Islam sure the fuck isn't is on the ballot. Rolling back our being a first world country is on the ballot, and not just this ballot, every ballot printed since I was born. As atheists and as our secularists, it is our duty 
to work to prevent that backslide that we've seen America cause to other places. That backslide that we've seen of what happens to areas where Al Qaeda is in power, the Al Qaeda that we used in a proxy war to fight the Russians in the 80s. What the backside that we see when we get involved in Iranian politics and extremists take over, we're doing that backsliding to ourselves. That's what's on the ballot, and that's what's on every ballot for the foreseeable future. And that's what I got here right now, right? So to get out of here, going forward, I'm switching up the Bible study episodes. Uh, critical examination of religious texts and their surrounding ideas and influences is the thrust of this show. But instead of reading it to you like it's the world's worst story time, I'm going to be narrating it and rewriting it slightly. The essence will still be there, but that's going to let it go by faster, and it's not going to be as boring, and I can zhuzh it up a little more, and I can improve the prose while still getting all of the educational points. If you don't like that idea, and uh, you want me to keep doing it the way I've been doing it, contact me email me. Your feedback matters. Uh, I'm fighting for your attention against a whole world that's fighting for your attention. So reach out. Let me let me know what's up and we'll we'll choose a safe word and we'll work together to achieve that. And if you have found this episode informative or useful, if you're a sadist who enjoys hearing me ramble semi-coherently about this stuff, or you're a masochist who want to subject your friends to whatever this is, tell them. Tell your friends, word of mouth advertising, because if I can set up advertising, I don't have to make a Patreon and beg in order to feed my children and hire some help around here, because I would like to get a better product out. This, I know this is, comes across like I'm a novice. I am. I'm learning. And if you do want to support the venture monetarily, the, the best way to do that is to head to the store, which will be in the show notes, and buy a shirt or a sticker or something. Going through my affiliate link uh, supports both the show and an independent artist, and that's something that really matters. Now, my letter, my Twitter is the letter X, Essential Panda, for me, uh, apostasy powered for just powered by apostasy related stuff in isolation, and the email to send feedback, questions, suggestions, any range of deletables is uh, powered by apostasy at gmail.com. I am Phineas 12 Gage, and you look great in those pants. Now, if you haven't voted, go fucking vote.